on the AI thing. So I've been thinking about this a bit. I've been working on something. I don't want to get deep into the weeds on it because I'm still I'm still doing a lot of reading on this. I've kind of gotten into this guy, Rene Girard, and his stuff about mimesis. Anyway, so I have this idea. If you've read something interesting, if this rings a bell with you, you know, send, drop me a note. Let me put it this way. Um, in the United States and other advanced economies, the amount of your labor dedicated to feeding yourself, keeping the lights on, and providing shelter has been shrinking over time. You know, obviously for poor people, it's a, it's a much bigger slice of their economic pie of their de- of their week. But you know, just go check out, play with the numbers at Human Progress, or look at the appendix of Suicide of the West. You'll see what I mean. I mean, the amount of time. You know, one of my favorite measurements of this is is the amount of time you have to work. Um, for an hour of light and um, like literally just a, an hour of indoor illumination. And that number has been plummeting um, for, you know, well, for 2000 years, you know, if not more, uh, actually definitely more. Um, and it's been plunging for the last century, right? You just, the amount of work you have to do to eat, to get a, the minimal number of calories to eat has been shrinking um, even for unskilled labor for a very, very long time. And as you move up the economic ladder to more more affluent people, um, you know, that stuff is, you know, not counting the fact people have more expensive houses and mansions and all of that kind of stuff. The sort of base necessity part of their working life has been covered, you know, and it's a minuscule fraction of of their work, right? And I think that's spreading. I mean, I think... Let's put it this way. If you take the rosy predictions about what AI can do, um, about, you know, about what, if you take the rosy predictions of how long it'll take for us to get uh, fusion reactors um, and sort of next generation or three generations from now, 3D printing and all that kind of stuff, you're starting to see a world glimpsed, you know, just over the horizon you know, barring some apocalyptic war or or fungal virus that turns us into zombies, you're really starting to look at a world that looks a lot more like the holodeck in Star Trek than you are um, one that looks like, you know, 1950s America. And, um, you know, as it is, you have people who can spend um, very little time actually making money and a lot of time entertaining themselves, and they're perfectly happy to do it. Um, unfortunately, some of these people have bad ideas about entertaining themselves, um, and entertaining themselves is more like, you know, video games and, and drug addiction, but you get the point, right? We can, you know, the attention economy is becoming a place where people are increasingly live or, or could in the future become a place where we live. And so what does a society like that look like? Again, if you take all the rosy, all the good stories of this, right? And let's just say it all plays out great and we have massive increases in productivity, massive increases in um, energy production um, to the point where we start cleaning up the environment and fixing the planet, all of these things. What are the criteria by which, you know, people get out of bed? What is it the thing, what is it if, if, if feeding yourself and feeding your family and providing for your family and providing for yourself really can become an afterthought? Why are people getting out of bed? What are people doing? And my view is, is that what, and I don't mean to go all sort of Jordan Peterson or anything like that here, but I think a big, the best explanation I can, best prediction I can come up with right now, and this is the thing that I'm thinking about, is um, status, right? What, you know, what will um, give one person a higher status socially, sociologically, politically than other people in that kind of economy. And um, that's not something I'm trying to think through. I think it's a really interesting question. I think part of what this sort of attention economy is about is that, right? I mean, right now, our definition of high status people, I shouldn't say my definition, but like, or your definition, but the, the definition that a lot of people have for a high status person is some social media influencer. Like the more followers you have, the more important you are. Um, the more subscribers you have, the more important you are. That's one aspect of what I am talking about is like those people, they're making money from their high status, right? Their, their work 
is their status stuff. And um, they're not the sort of the old complaint about capitalism was that being rich gave you high status, that making money increased your, your, your status in society. And, you know, we forget that the original people to complain about that were not the proletariat and the working class. They were the aristocrats. Um, you know, the phrase, uh, you know, jumpstart or upstart um, uh, goes back to the idea of people who were elevated above their station because of, um, you know, because of money to a certain extent, right? Um, the, the old ar aristocrats in Europe were the descendants of, of warlords, right? They were the warriors uh, who, who gained power, um, you know, centuries earlier and then held on to their land and were stationary bandits in the Mansur Olson sense and whatnot. And, um, and they came up with concepts like nobility and aristocracy to justify their intergenerational power and wealth. And then along come in the, you know, starting, I guess, the 15th and 16th century, but then in earnest um, during the Enlightenment, you know, these people who are, um, who are able to buy titles of nobility, buy um, uh, status because of their money. And the old aristocratic stick class hated um, the new bourgeois or uh, new money type people, right? Because they thought they were all low class people with bad bloodlines and whatnot. I think that's a natural human reaction. You get that, you know, from almost any group or organization where the, the newcomer is looked at suspiciously. But it, it's different at scale in all sorts of ways when you're talking about whole societies. It's also part of the explanation for anti-Semitism um, in Europe is that, you know, uh, with the emancipation of Jews, Jews all of a sudden were allowed to compete in all sorts of ways in the broader, you know, economy and broader institutions. And uh, they did well. And that was deemed to be illegitimate in some way. Um, but anyway, in today's society, you got particularly people under the age of, say, 30 um, being a celebrity is a new kind of arist aristocrat, aristocratic, aristocratic status. Um, you know, wh what, what have the Kardashians done, um, to be, you know, to have the place that they have in, you know, in the hearts and minds of lots of people. And, um, and so anyway, like if you, at least in the old school, like, I understand getting status, you know, esteem, if you want a different word, um, social rank from being a great warrior, right? That, that, that makes sense to me. I'm not saying that we should go back to that sort of society, but it makes sense to me. Um, and I get that, um, and I'm much more sympathetic to the idea of you having great status if you are a great business person and you've provided real value to society and you're rewarded in the marketplace with money. I mean, uh, I haven't mentioned this in a long time, but I always think about Tim Carney's point about uh, how much he hates it when he hears rich people say they want to give back to society. And his example was the guy who invented the cronut and, um, you know, which is this croissant donut hybrid, um, which I've never had, but it's supposed to be just friggin' delicious. And, um, and Tim was always like, you know, look, you know, you don't owe us anything. You gave us the cronut and you took like a penny on each one for your profit for you personally, you know, other than building up your business. And, um, you know, we thank you for the cronut, but you don't owe us anything more. You made the cronut. You gave us, you gave society the cronut, you know, and that's how I feel about all sorts of, you know, business innovations is like the, the proof that they gave something to society is because they sold well. Obviously, if you spend two minutes, you can think of exam counter examples that are probably aren't good on this point, you know, from everything from, you know, drugs to pornography, but you get the point.